Hi. Uh, today we continue our discussion of rotational motion. So far we considered uh, bodies rotating about a fixed axis. And today we will observe some effects uh, which are related to rotating bodies with a non-fixed um, axis. Uh, such bodies which can rotate uh, about the axis like, like this one and the axis is not fixed in bearings but is free to move in any direction. So uh, let's observe what happens in this particular case. Okay. Such a symmetric body uh, is called a free gyroscope. Uh, it rotates and the axis is not fixed in bearings. The axis of this rotating body can move and the motion uh, such a motion is called a precession of gyroscope. That is a regular rotation of the axis about which the body rotates. We see that the axis of rotation does not remain constant in space. It moves in rotational, it's engaged in some rotational motion itself. So how can we explain such motion? We consider this rotating body, which rotates in this direction, and it has the axis, and the body is on the table, and it rotates at high angular velocity, so that the angular velocity vector is directed along the axis of this body. And the angular momentum for symmetric body is given by this formula, where I is the moment of inertia. For symmetric body, the moment of inertia is just a scalar quantity. It's not a tensor. We discussed this issue last time. So for this symmetric rotating body, I is just a coefficient here. And vector L is parallel to vector vector omega. Uh, the angular momentum is directed along the vector of angular velocity. And we know the main equation. This is the law of physics which governs the rotational motion. DL dt, that is the rate of change of angular momentum of this vector, is defined by the moment of external forces or torques. Okay, now we seem to be ready to we seem to be ready to observe another interesting effect, actually the same, actually the same sort of effects. Mm -hmm. So we have a symmetric rotating body with three axes. Such a body is called a gyroscope. And the first thing we will try just rotate the table. And rotating the table, we see that the axis of rotation remains unchanged. The table may be rotated in any direction, but the axis of this gyroscope remains unchanged. This is because of the law of conservation of angular momentum. And the angular momentum is conserved here because 
no external torque is acting on this uh, rotating gyroscope. Now if we hang the load, that load will create an external torque, some force which is applied not in the center of mass but applied at some distance from the center of mass so that there is the radius vector to the point of application of this force and the force of gravity of this load, heavy load, directed downward so that this force will create a torque, a torque equal to radius multiplied vec and vector multiplication, vector product by uh, gravity force. So if we take this vector product, we understand that the uh, external torque is directed <coughs> in such a way that it causes the vector of angular momentum to change. The change of vector of angular momentum is directed in this way. Oh, the direction of rotation. So the vector of angular momentum if, if it's rotating clockwise, then the vector of angular momentum is directed here, and the torque tends to m change the vector of angular momentum in, uh, in the direction which you can observe here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Such was the motion of gyroscope under a constant torque. If I apply non-constant, but uh, quickly changing torque, that is quickly changing external force, then the motion of such gyroscope is far from precession. This such motion is called nutation. The nutation of a gyroscope is the reaction of gyroscope to a quickly changing external force. So the gyroscope can exhibit uh, two different sorts of motion. The regular precession, which is caused by constant external torque, and mutation, which is caused by, this is mutation again, which is caused by uh, non-constant, but quickly changing external torque. Returning to theoretical consideration of uh, the gyroscope motion, we can see that this point O is fixed, and there is uh, some gravity force applied to the center of mass of this rotating body. And the radius vector drawn from the center, from the fixed center, fixed point, to the point of application of external force, the radius vector, uh, radius vector times external force, by definition, is uh, the torque acting on the rotating body. What will be the direction of this vector, m? The direction can easily be uh, calculated if you remember the rules of taking the vector product of two vectors. So the first vector looks here. And if we ro rotate the first vector to so that it coincides with the second vector, then the uh, direction of rotation will, uh, will give you the direction of rotation of um, screw, which will go, the end of the screw will go in this direction. So the end of the screw will go, will point to the blackboard. And uh, that will be the direction of this vector, vector of the external force, external torque. This vector will be directed towards the blackboard due to the rules of uh, vector product of two vectors. And so if the vector of m is directed here to the blackboard, then 
vector L of angular momentum will change, and the change of angular momentum will have the same direction as the vector of external torque. That is, the very change dL will be directed towards the blackboard. So that the vector L will change, and finally, it will turn. It will turn. It will show some regular precession, because when vector L changes its direction, then vector R also changes its direction together with L. And so vector M will change its direction in such a way that vector L will always be directed along the tangent line to such a circular trajectory, which will be described by the end of vector L. So the end of vector L will move along a circular trajectory, which, which could be observed here on this on the example of this simple top. In this particular case, if we go from vector form to scalar form, scalar form of this equation, the scalar magnitude of the rate of change of angular momentum will be defined by, by the magnitude of this vector which will be R F and the sign between these two vectors, this angle or this one, alpha, according to the rules of finding a vector product. You have to take the sign between the two vectors. So that will be R M G sine alpha. <coughs> so that dL equals rmg sine alpha multiplied by dt. And dL is directed along the tangent, tangent line to the cir circular trajectory. So this this is dL. This is dL. And uh, the radius of this circle, of this circular trajectory, this radius will be equal to L sine alpha. And we know that The angle d phi, the angle of rotation of the end point of this vector L, by definition, by definition, small angle is defined as uh, d L divided by radius, which is L sine alpha. That is the length of the arc divided by radius of this circle, which is L sine alpha. So that dL from here can be found as, from here dL can be found as L sine alpha d phi. And this magnitude of dL expressed through the angle of rotation of the end of vector L can be used here. We can substitute this equation, this quantity here. And then we will find that L sine alpha d phi equals R m g sine alpha dt. Sine alpha will cancel, and uh, d phi divided by dt, by definition, is the angular velocity of rotation of the end of this vector L, of this point. 
along such circular trajectory. So this angular velocity does not coincide with small omega. It's different angular velocity because small omega is the angular velocity of rotation of this uh, symmetric body, of this gyroscope. It's very high. It's high, it's very, very large. But this point, uh, the end of vector L, is also rotating, but the angular velocity of this motion is much smaller. So I will have to denote this quantity by a different uh, letter, say it's capital omega, and that will be the capital omega, the angular velocity of precession of vector L, the angular velocity of precession of vector L, d phi dt uh, by definition, and from this equation we find it to be equal rmg divided by L, or rmg divided L is the magnitude of vector L is moment of inertia I of the gyroscope and its angular velocity. So this formula determines the angular velocity of rotation of the axis of this body. The axis uh, rotates in such a way you have seen it, and the angular velocity of this rotation is defined by this formula. It's inversely proportional to the uh, small omega, which is the angular velocity of rotation of the, s of the body itself, of the gyroscope, about the, the axis. This uh, quantity, small omega, may be orders of mag magnitude larger than the angular velocity of the motion of the axis itself. So this is the motion, the angular velocity of rotation of the gyroscope axis, the angular velocity of precession, and this is the angular velocity of gyroscope rotation about, about this axis. And this is the moment of inertia of gyroscope. So if we increase omega, small omega, if we increase the angular velocity of rotation of gyroscope, then the velocity of precession will, be, will become smaller. The higher the angular velocity, the smaller the uh, precession uh, angular velocity. The same theory applies to the experiment which we have shown here, which we have observed. The gyroscope axis remained fixed in space when no external torques acted on this uh, gyroscope. And we could rotate the table and whatever rotation of the table, the gyroscope axis remained fixed in space when it was rotating quickly. The gyroscope axis was fixed. It remained constant, unchanged, because no external torques acted on this gyroscope. But when we applied external force acting, applied not, not to the center of mass, but at some distance from the center of mass, then external torque appeared, and the gyroscope motion was not like now. It was different because now the gyroscope is not rotating. But when it was rotating quickly, the precession looked like this. The gyroscope axis was rotating with some small angular velocity. And this small angular velocity is again defined by this formula. And the larger the velocity of gyroscope rotation, the smaller will be the velocity, angular velocity of uh, precession of gyroscope. Uh, OK. Now we will return to an experiment which I showed you uh, during our very first lecture. And we will think about how to explain it, because we know everything to explain this experiment. OK, 
what you see here again the gyroscope that is the symmetric body which rotates and its axis remains free it's not fixed in bearings and this free axis is in touch with some curved surface and it somehow happens that the axis of this gyroscope follows the shape of this surface always being pressed against this curved surface we have seen this experiment uh, during the first lecture and now we are ready to explain it So in this particular experiment, we had a gyroscope that is a symmetric rotating body. And there was an axle of this gyroscope. I will show it in this way, the axle. The gyroscope was rotating in such a way that the angular velocity was directed here and the vector of angular momentum also has this di the same direction as angular velocity. And the axle of this gyroscope was in touch, to was in touch with some curved surface. So here was the point of contact. What happens here, if the surface of the axle rotates in such way with some angular velocity, then this point of the axle moves towards the audience out of the blackboard. And therefore, there is a force of friction acting here on the axle. And the force of friction is against the velocity. The force of friction is directed towards the, towards the blackboard. I will show it in this way. The force of friction is directed towards the blackboard because it's against, it's directed oppositely to the velocity of the points of the surface of this axle which, which touch the curved surface. So from the curved surface, there is a force of friction acting on the surface of this rotating axle. And this force of friction has its own torque, which is by definition a force of friction. And R is the radius vector from the fixed point O to this point. So R is radius vector from here to here. That's it. Vector R. If we consider this vector product, what will be the direction of vector M? The direction of torque will be defined by the rotation of vector R towards vector F. And uh, thinking about this rotation, you will understand that vector m is directed here, towards the curved surface. According to the law of physics, this external torque defines the rate of change of angular momentum. And the change of angular momentum, dl, during a short period of time dt must be directed also towards the direction of vector m. But it can't go through the curved surface. The only thing the gyroscope does, it presses against the curved surface. The torque of the force of friction causes the gyroscope axle to be pressed against the curved surface 
always in every point of the curved surface this logic works and in every point the gyroscope axis will be pressed against this curved surface. That's why the gyroscope always goes in such a way as to touch and to be pressed against the curved surface. And the force of friction also is engaged in some other uh, law of physics here. I mean the law of motion of the center of mass, the center of mass of gyroscope. So we know that the mass of gyroscope, the acceleration of the center of mass, is the total external force. Also, there is another force acting at point O, but this cannot cause the gyroscope to move because this point is generally fixed. And uh, the force of friction pushes the gyroscope to move in the direction of the force of friction. So the force of friction uh, is engaged in two different actions. First, the force of friction creates a torque which, which causes the gyroscope axis uh, to be pressed against the curved surface. And also the force of friction causes the center of mass of the gyroscope to move in, in the direction of the force of friction. So that the gyroscope axis being always pressed against the surface, curved surface moves along it, uh, describing the same the same uh, shape which has this curved, surf curved surface. So the, this point moves along the surface because of the force of friction and the gyroscope axis is pressed against the surface because of the torque of this force of friction. So uh, now the knowledge acquired by students up to this point allows them to understand this phenomenon and describe it in correct way. Okay. Uh, phenomena with different phenomena with gyroscopes is very important in many technical applications. <coughs> like, uh, like here you have seen in this experiment the gyroscope axis remains constant, <coughs> remains unchanged, uh, even when the table was rotating. Uh, this quality of gyroscope, of free gyroscope, is is used in aircraft and in rockets and in spaceships uh, in order to uh, determine the position of um, an aircraft, for example. Even if the aircraft flies in the clouds and uh, the pilots do not see the horizon and they cannot see the sky and stars, uh, they know well the position of their aircraft because of the gyroscopic system <coughs> of uh, automatic control and the gyroscopes which are on board uh, on board the aircraft uh, they always show the direction if you have three different gyroscopes with the axis directed along x y and z axis the three perpendicular cartesian axis then you always know the direction of each cartesian axis and so whatever position the aircraft takes in space, you can always know the angles between the aircraft axis uh, and uh, b between the aircraft body and the axis, the Cartesian axis X, Y, Z. Because of the gyroscopes on board the aircraft and uh, the possibility to measure the angle between the gyroscope axis and the aircraft body. So the gyroscopes used are used in navigation system and system of automatic control of aircraft and rockets. Now, 
we will consider another interesting experiment uh -huh. which you can see on the screen there is a ball and uh, a gyroscope is inside the ball and the gyroscope is rotating at very high velocity here about three about 30,000 revolutions per minute that is about 500 revolutions per second and so the gyroscopic effect makes this ball stable on on a very thin needle on which it stands. That's, if you look at the screen, there is a thin needle and the ball does not fall down from this needle because the <coughs> oh, now it falls, because forces of friction are not very, not very high, because it's slipping. It's slipping down from. It's slipping down from the. Uh, from this needle. Uh huh. Well, it's obviously in stable position. It doesn't fall down. Uh, regardless of the fact that it can easily turn over and turn and fall down, but it doesn't because there is a gyroscope inside and the gyroscope keeps the ball stable, uh, not allowing it to fall down. Okay, спасибо. Enough. Another thing concerning uh, the gyroscopes and uh, rotating solid bodies, uh, we have discussed it. If there are no external forces and no torques of external forces, then the derivative of the angular momentum with respect to time will be zero. If the external force is zero, then L dot is zero. And this case, in this particular case, the angular momentum of the system of material bodies remains constant in time. If its derivative is zero, then the vector itself is constant. And we considered this law and discussed it, and this is the law of conservation of angular momentum of a system of material bodies. And this law holds for closed system when no external torques act on the on this system of bodies. And the conservation of angular momentum will be demonstrated now on this interesting experimental setup. We have a rotating chair which can easily rotate about the vertical axis. And also there is a bicycle wheel which will be rotated quickly now. The purpose is to have a high velocity of rotation, high angular velocity, because the higher the velocity, the higher the velocity, the larger will be the angular momentum and now, now the person uh -huh. вверх можно поднять его. Uh -huh. If you keep, if the person keeps the rotating wheel upward, then he will rotate on the rotating chair in opposite direction and now if we if we uh, change the direction of the wheel axis then the direction of the person in the chair will also change 
he will he will he will turn in different direction now it's counterclockwise and when the when the uh, when the wheel is upward then the direction of rotation is clockwise if you if you look from above so what what phenomenon is here there are no external torques acting on the system of material bodies here no external torques it means that the angular momentum of the system is conserved so if something inside the system changes then in order to keep the total angular momentum constant we observe some internal rotations occurring either in one direction or in another direction because of this law of uh, momentum conservation so in this particular experiment we had two bodies the person sitting on the chair and the chair itself is one body and the second body was a uh, bicycle wheel so we had two different bodies which uh, constitute this system of closed system of bodies and the first body say the bicycle wheel has its own angular momentum and the second body the person on the chair has its own angular momentum and this should be constant in time so if the direction of the first vector changes that is if we change the direction of the rotating wheel axis then the second vector should also change in order to keep the sum of two angular momenta constant if the first vector is changed then the second vector should also be changed it changes by itself because of the law of nature because the total momentum must remain constant so whatever change of the uh, direction of the bicycle wheel there should be corresponding change in the direction of the second body inside this closed system that's the reason behind that's the reason behind this phenomenon so we have studied we now have finished this topic of a general case of rotation of solid body we have observed gyroscopes and gyroscopic effects uh, which involve uh, gyroscope precession and gyroscope mutation <coughs> and mutation is also very important phenomenon which is often observed even in nature even our planet earth as it rotates about its axis is a natural gyroscope and uh, this gyroscope is not absolutely symmetric and besides uh, it was under the influence it's constantly under the influence from the moon and the sun and uh, due to uh, tidal waves on the surface of our planet uh, the action exerted on the earth from the moon and from the sun caused this the earth axis of rotation to to change its direction so there is some mutation of the axis of rotation of the earth in space the axis of earth rotation which is believed to go from the south pole to the north pole of the earth it does not remain absolutely constant in time it slowly changes its direction and this is a natural mutation of uh, the earth axis of rotation also there are many other interesting phenomena occurring in rotating solid bodies uh, the students now will be able to analyze this phenomena by themselves because they know all the theory related and all the laws of nature uh, related to these phenomena now five minutes interval
So after all these experiments with gyroscopes, we start a new topic. We must discuss non-inertial reference frames. <coughs> non-inertial reference frames. <coughs> So if we consider point A from some inertial reference frame x, y, z, and the point A will have radius vector, let it be r prime, because I will not be interested in the motion of point A with, re with respect to this inertial reference frame. I will be interested in the motion of point A with respect to some non-inertial reference frame, which will be given by point O. And this non-inertial reference frame may be descri described by vector R with respect to the inertial reference frame O prime. According to this triangle of vectors, we can easily say that uh, that vector r prime equals capital R plus small r. As point A is moving and the reference frame O point O is also moving, then from here we conclude that all these vectors are functions of time. And we can consider time derivative of these vectors and also the second time derivative. And the relationship will remain the same. So what is the what is the uh, second derivative of vector r prime? That is acceleration of point A with respect to point O prime, because vector R prime describes the position of point A with respect to reference frame O prime. So this, that will be acceleration, which is naturally de denoted by A prime. What is the second derivative of vector capital R? That is the acceleration of system O, of point O, with respect to the inertial or fixed reference frame O prime. Acceleration of the reference frame O. And uh, the remaining term here is naturally the acceleration of point A with respect to reference frame O. That is the quantity in which we are interested in, the acceleration of some point with respect to non-inertial reference frame, which itself is moving and moving probably with acceleration, acceleration A0 with respect to the fixed reference frame. So from here, we obtain that the acceleration under consideration, which, is, uh, which we are interested in, will be A prime minus A0. And multiplying this equation by the mass of point A, we will obtain ma equal to ma prime minus ma0. What is ma? The mass times acceleration due to ne Newton's second law is the force acting on point A. Not exactly so. It's uh, it's acceleration. Sorry, it's acceleration with respect to moving point. Uh, the force acting on the point A is uh, defined through the acceleration with respect to the fixed reference frame O prime. So that will be the force acting 
the force acting on the point, uh, on the mass m. The force acted acting on the mass m due to Newton's second law equals the mass times acceleration of this point, which is measured in an inertial reference frame, or in our case, in the fixed reference frame O prime. That is the force acting on the body due to the Newton's second law. So that if the acceleration of the second reference frame O is zero, then we obtain the usual Newton's law, ma equals f. If the acceleration of the second reference frame is zero. But if the second reference frame moves with some non-zero acceleration with respect to the fixed frame, then A0 is not uh, equal to zero. And in this case, in this case, uh, the acceleration of point A measured in the moving and accelerating reference frame will be defined both by the force and by something else. There is another term here in this equation. This another term is called a force of inertia. force of inertia. So in order to apply a second Newton's law in non-inertial reference frame, that is in the reference frame which is accelerating itself, we have to add some force of inertia to uh, usual forces. Force F is, uh, is the usual force of which we know that this is the measure of interaction between different bodies. So force F is due to interaction between point M and some external bodies. But this second term has nothing to do with interaction. It's not caused by uh, interacting interaction with outside bodies. It cannot be caused. It cannot be the result of any interaction, neither gravitational nor e electromagnetic, nothing like that. This, this term is caused by acceleration of the system of reference. And this term is, caused, is called a force of inertia. Uh, so the force of inertia arises not due to interaction, not due to physical interactions with some other bodies, but due to other reasons. That's why people sometimes call the force of inertia a fictitious force. Sometimes people call it a fictitious force because this force is not caused by interaction. However, this term, a fictitious force, should not be understood in such a way as, as if this force was non-existent, as if this term was somehow somewhat imaginary. No, this is very real. This is very real force with the only difference that it's not caused by interaction, but it's caused by the acceleration. For example, if you are in a bus which rides at high velocity, and then the bus breaks and stops abruptly. So the bus goes at high velocity, and then suddenly the bus stops, and the velocity tends to zero. If this happens in, very, in a short period of time, then all the passengers in sight, all the passengers in sight, will tend to fall down, will tend to fall, to, will tend to, to be thrown in the direction of motion, and they will have to hold fast in order not to fall down, and some, some of them 
even fall down because, because they feel some force is acting on them. Some force tends to throw them in the direction of motion if the bus stopped quickly. So this force is very real. The force of inertia will act on the passenger because the passenger will find himself in a non-inertial reference frame in a bus which is accelerating. And the acceleration, <coughs> uh, the acceleration will be, if the bus stops, the acceleration will be directed here. And the force of inertia this direct is directed oppositely the acceleration, because here is the minus sign. So the force which will throw the passengers forward, the force will be directed oppositely the acceleration according to this equation. And the passengers will, will go, will, will be thrown forward in the direction of the bus, if the bus stops with negative acceleration, with deceleration. <coughs> so this is quite understandable. Uh, what happens in a non-inertial reference frame. Also, another example is an elevator cabin. If there is a load M hanging on a spring from the ceiling, the force due to interaction acting on this load is Mg, the acceleration of free fall. And suppose the, this uh, elevator cabin goes down with acceleration A0. The elevator cabin goes down with acceleration. Then what happens to this, what happens to this mass? According to this equation, uh, there will be some force of inertia acting on the body and directed upward, because the force of inertia is directed oppositely the acceleration. If the acceleration is downward, then the force of inertia will be upward because of this minus sign. And this force will, co will cause the spring will cause the spring to shorten. The spring originally spread. Uh, are originally having this length will then have something like this, a smaller length, because the force of inertia will act against the force of gravity. And if the acceleration, if the acceleration of the elevator cabin equals the acceleration of free fall, that is, if the elevator cabin falls down with the acceleration of free fall, then the spring will not be extended at all. And the total force acting on the body will be mg minus mg will be 0. The total force acting on this body will be 0. And the spring will not be extended in this particular case if the elevator cabin falls down with acceleration equal to the acceleration of free fall. Such is the simple analysis of uh, phenomena occurring in accelerating reference frames. Now we consider a very special case of non-inertial reference frame we will consider a rotating reference frame. That's a particular case, a particular case of non-inertial reference frame. <coughs> so let's consider a rotating body which rotates with some angular velocity so that the vector of angular velocity is directed upward according to the laws of kinematics. And uh, imagine there is a Cartesian reference frame attached to this rotating wheel. 
Cartesian reference frame with unit vectors i, j, and k. Cartesian reference frame consisting of three perpendicular vectors frozen to this rotating body so that this reference frame is non-inertial. It's rotating together with, with the body. It's rotating at angular velocity omega. So anybody who lives in this rotating reference frame will consider unit vectors i, j, k as fixed, as non-moving. But an external observer will see that this reference frame rotates together with the body. So there are two observers. One observer is in laboratory reference frame, and he can see that this reference frame is rotating. Another observer is sitting in this reference frame, is sitting, is rotating together with, with this body. And so with respect to this another observer, uh, the, the three vectors are fixed. They don't move. Suppose there is some point A in the rotating reference frame. <coughs> some point A, somebody is sitting on this wheel, rotating wheel here at this point. This point has radius vector r in non-inertial reference frame O. And certainly, vector r can be presented as, in its usual way, as ix, jy, plus kz. And we want to define the acceleration of point A in general case. That is, in the case when point A is moving with respect to the reference frame O. So point A may be moving, may have some velocity v relative to the rotating disk, relative to the rotating disk. It may be a bug or a fly crawling on the surface of this disk. Or if the disk is large enough, and that is a person, he may be moving, like going in this direction with velocity v. And uh, this velocity is relative, is calculated relative to the rotating reference frame, the rotating body. So we need to find the acceleration of this point with respect to laboratory reference frame or with respect and with respect to the rotating reference frame. So in order to find accelerations and velocities, we, as usual, take the time derivative of vector r. And the time derivative of vector r will be given like f. In order to find time derivative of the product of two quantities, we first, first we must differentiate the first, uh, the first term in this product and then differentiate the second term. So with differentiating the first term, we will, we will obtain i dot x plus j dot y plus k dot z. And then we leave the first coefficients, the vectors, unchanged and differentiate the second term in the product. The second term will be x dot plus j y dot plus k z dot. Considering the first term in round brackets here, I will use as a very good, very well known to you uh, way to represent the unit vector rotating with angular velocity omega. That will be uh, omega vector squared by i times x. So I will use this 
formula that vector i time derivative is vector product of omega times i. We discussed this sort of formulas when we considered kinematics of rotational motion. So the first term here, i dot, will be given by this expression. j dot will be given by similar expression, vector product of omega times j, y. And k dot will be given by omega times k, in general case, z. Plus the second term. The second term is i, j, k with x dot, that is dx, dt, that is x component of the velocity v with respect, uh, velocity v of point A taken with respect to rotating disk. So this is the x component of velocity and the y component, z component of velocity. So the second term here in round brackets will be just the velocity of point A with respect to, with respect to uh, rotating disk. And continuing this, I will take the omega out of every uh, addend here. I will factor the omega in such a way that the omega will be multiplied by ix plus jy plus kz and plus the velocity not to forget about this last term. What is written in the round brackets here? Radius vector r. So what we have in round brackets, that is radius vector r written here. So that in resu as a result, we get vector product of omega times radius vector r plus the velocity v. That is the r dot, the quantity of r dot, time derivative of vector r. So the second term, we already discussed it. It's relative velocity, that is the velocity of point A relative to the rotating disk. That is the relative velocity, relative velocity. And the first term here is called the drag velocity. The drag velocity is just the velocity of circular motion of point A in case the relative velocity is zero. That is, if point A is uh, fixed to the rotating disk, then point A will describe some circular trajectory, and uh, its velocity will be uh, zero with respect to the disk. But with respect to the laboratory reference frame, it will have some velocity of uh, simple circular motion, which is called drag velocity in this formula. <coughs> the velocity is not the purpose of our calculations. The purpose, our purpose is to calculate the acceleration, r dot dot. In order to calculate the acceleration, I have to, I have to differentiate this expression with respect to with respect to time, that is d, dt of this expression, omega vector product by r plus v. In order to calculate the time derivative of this product, I have first to take a derivative of the first term and product multiplied by the second term plus the first term multiplied by the second term dot. So first I differentiate omega and then differentiate r. And then I have to differentiate v. That 
That is the acceleration second derivative of the radius vector. The purpose of my calculations is to find the acceleration of a body in a non-inertial reference frame. So what is omega dot? This is angular acceleration. Angular acceleration, I will consider a simple case when the angular velocity is constant and there is no angular acceleration of this rotating system. So in my simple, in my simple case, this will be 0, just because I simplify the situation not to consider angular acceleration of uh, reference frame, but just to consider the constant angular velocities, constant velocities of rotation of uh, reference frame O. And here I will have to use, uh, so that will be, the second term will be omega v, because r dot uh, R dot is finally this expression. I have to use this expression. Instead of R dot here, I have to use this formula, and I have to substitute it here. So that will be omega times R plus V and plus V dot, the remaining term here. That will be omega vector product by omega vector product by r plus omega vector product omega vector product by v and plus v dot. What is v dot? I have to take the v, that is this expression, and differentiate it in time. So differentiate this expression in time. I will put it in this way. I will just, first of all, when I differentiate it in time, I will have to put dot over unit vectors, and I will have the second derivative of unit vectors which is 0 by assumption. I assume that uh, the rotation is uh, without any angular acceleration. No angular acceleration. So I don't have to take the second derivative of these vectors. So only the first derivative will remain. That is i dot. And I will have to take the, the derivative only uh, only of the second term in each product. So i dot remains here and x dot plus j dot y dot plus k dot z dot. That is after differentiating the first round bracket. I don't have to differentiate the unit vectors because the second derivative is acceleration, angular acceleration, and I don't want to consider accelerated uh, Accelerate, accelerating,ly rotated bodies. I want to consider bodies rotating at constant angular velocity. So the second derivative will be zero, and the, and the second derivative of the coordinates x, y, z is not zero. And so now I will have to differentiate the second round bracket here. The second round bracket. Now I will have to put dots over every unit vector, because the first derivative is non-zero. The first derivative is non-zero. That will be i dot x dot plus 
j dot y dot plus k dot z dot. And now I will have to differentiate to take the second derivative of x, y, and z. But this is also zero because I assume that the point A moves at constant velocity v. So I don't have to take to consider x two dots. x two dots is the x component of acceleration of point A with respect to the rotating reference frame O. But I assume that the point A moves with constant velocity, moves at constant velocity, so the second derivative of x, y, and z should not be considered here. have already considered such a, an expression in round brackets <coughs> which involves the first derivative with respect to uh, first derivative of a unit vectors we have already considered and we have already used uh, this formula when i dot equals omega multiplied by i vector product between omega and unit vector i so I will use the same trick now, and uh, all this expression will be modified to some extent. <coughs> I will find that the first term here is the well-known centripetal acceleration. It's the centripetal acceleration of point A. Plus, I will have uh, omega times i, as I explained it, when i dot equals omega times i, and multiplied by x dot y dot z dot. This, is, uh, this will be <coughs> x component of velocity and y component velocity, so that this term will be equal to uh, omega multiplied by i x dot plus j, y dot plus k, z dot. And the same term and another same term here. So that we will have, and this is, this is the velocity of the body, v, by definition. Because this is x component of the velocity of point A, and y component of velocity, and z component of velocity of point A. So that we will have centripetal acceleration plus 2 omega times v. That's what we arrive at finally after all these calculations. The centripetal acceleration, if we consider the vector form, the vector form of centripetal acceleration is given here, but the magnitude of centripetal acceleration, the centripetal acceleration in magnitude, will be equal just omega squared r, which is a well-known uh, expression from kinematics. And this is something new. This is this term occurs when the velocity of motion of point A with respect to the rotating disk is non-zero. If point A is fixed on the disk and does not move with respect to disk, then the, its velocity v will be zero and no second term here. And I will have the result, the well-known result, that the acceleration of point A is just the centripetal acceleration which is given to by omega squared r. But if point A moves, with respect to disk A, with respect to the rotating disk, 
at some velocity v, then we obtain the second term here. And this second term is called the Coriolis acceleration. Coriolis acceleration. The second term is Coriolis acceleration. And we will discuss it next time in a greater detail. Now, as we have the end of this lecture, let's close it. Let's finish. <coughs>